December 17th of 1987 uh, marked a, a threshold in the evolution of the investigation here of the UFO phenomenon in Gulf Breeze. Uh, on that night, Ed Walters, from his house just down here, uh, got the familiar buzzing he'd been accustomed to hearing with the, the craft showing up, and he looked out and saw this craft right out here above the field, just a, a few feet above the ground. And what was remarkable about that in the photograph that followed was in the days and weeks of the investigation that followed, we had a, a physical phenomenon. The craft had affected the, the grass here and the soil in such a way that first uh, all of the grass had turned white and the ground itself had uh, undergone uh, some sort of energy exposure. For two years, you could clearly see the mark where this craft had been hovering. Uh, the local grounds crew here at the school had come out and put fertilizer down and seeded it and watered it and couldn't get anything to grow. And as you can see, they even recently brought in uh, a brown type of topsoil, which is different than the white surrounding sand here. And you can see they've still not been successful in getting something to grow here in the field. It's been six months since we saw the UFO go down. And as you can see, the bird spot is still visible. This happens to be the sample from the Medford site, number two, which does show some strange luminescence properties. And so I'd want to make sure that the sample that I'm dealing with is not in itself radioactive. And I don't find that it is. I don't see any evidence of increased radioactivity. Furnace ready to be inserted here into the light chamber. And now we've inserted the sample, which is on the electric furnace, into the chamber. And we're going to start heating it. Well, we're going to start off uh, here by looking then at the glow curves, which I ran about uh, two months ago on the Medford site. And if we look at the curve at the center of the site, we see that there's just a very small rise here. That is, the luminescence peak is very small. At the edge of the site, as we proceed along here, at the edge of the site, we discover the intense luminescence. Now, this luminescence that we are observing is apparently the result of some sort of radiation effect. It looks at least as though that particular uh, sample at the edge of the site has been subjected to some kind of high energy radiation. These are soil samples taken from five recent UFO landing sites and are fairly representative of uh, some two to three hundred UFO landing sites that I have personally been involved with. Each of the pins in this map represents a UFO landing site that has been reported to Ted Phillips in the last eight years. There are over 150 UFO landing sites represented on this map. I've investigated a rather high percentage of these reports personally and have found a remarkable consistency in size and shape uh, regarding the UFO scene and the ground effects resulting from that UFO landing. We find imprints left evidently by the landing gear of the object some of these indicating tremendous pressure, uh, great weight, generally uh, found as three or four in number, arranged in either a triangular or rectangular pattern. We have effects on witnesses, such as the witnesses suffering what appears to be a sunburn effect on their face, neck, and hands, following the close approach of a UFO, extreme dryness of the nasal area, extreme dryness of the throat. I have talked with nearly 2,000 people who have had a UFO experience. And those people uh, certainly have convinced me that something very real is going on. This is a small portion of the soil taken from a UFO landing site in Delphos, Kansas. The soil in the UFO landing ring is extremely dehydrated and is unable to absorb water. Instead, it simply floats. Soil taken only a few feet away that was not part of the UFO landing ring behaved normally. Within a few seconds, it absorbed the water that we poured on it. Besides being unable to absorb water, UFO affected soil cannot support seed germination and plant life. Soil taken a few feet away does support normal plant growth. No matter how vivid a hallucination is, it cannot dehydrate soil. 80% of the descriptions of a UFO in Ted Phillips' files are of a disc-shaped object between 10 and 35 feet in diameter. 
Over 400 of the landing cases in these files involve more than one witness observing a UFO for longer than one minute at a distance of less than 250 feet. We're talking about people, uh, police officers, clergymen, newsmen, business people, people in all walks of life from all parts of the country who have had real UFO experiences, and in many cases at very close range. The interesting thing is that these people could witness a murder, could go into court, testify to that effect, put a, a man away for life, and yet those same people have a UFO experience and their testimony is no longer valid. That's certainly a very strange uh, set of double standards that we have in this country. It's difficult to understand. During the past 10 years, I've talked with uh, over two dozen military personnel who have confidentially uh, relate cases involving uh, not only landings very near or on military installations in this country, but also cases involving physical residue. In one instance, uh, an individual assured me that he had personally seen to the transmission of this report to Project Blue Book, and this was a report involving a landing and quite a number of, of witnesses, security personnel. And if one is to check the Blue Book files, the files that have been open to the public. Those cases are not there, not a single case. Professor Semyakov is a biologist. No, обычно мы стараемся, чтобы были свидетели. Значит, лучше, если бывает несколько свидетелей, которые фиксируют это место. А затем мы проводим параллельные исследования, то есть делаем биолокацию и либо радиометрическим методом определяем место посадки НЛО. Там характерно было то, что было давлено почва, как бы огромный каток был поставлен на почву диаметром 4 метра. Почва была вдавлена на 5 сантиметров. Это пока говорит о очень большом весе НЛО. И НЛО представляло собой, как по следам, по рассказам очевидцам, колбу. Эта колба была как бы на ножке стояла на поляне и возвышалась даже над лесом на 5 метров. И что для этого пришлось сделать небольшой аппарат. Он заключался в том, что в камер... мы взяли камеру, в этой камере была мембрана, и, и в эту камеру сажа... помещались мухи. Но мухи какие? Дрозофилы, бескрылые линии. Мухи могли только бегать по, по, это... по, это... и по этому... Значит, по этой мембране, но не могли летать. Далее шел усилитель, и все это прослушалось с наушниками. Получалось так. Достаточно было. Вот, в частности, эти исследования проведены также в Шарапе охоте. Было достаточно войти на мест... в зону посадки НЛО, как мухи возбуждались. Достаточно было выйти из зоны посадки, мухи опять затихали. Обычно в темноте, в камере, в которой они находятся, они ведут себя тихо и не двигаются. Таким образом, мы можем создать и биоиндикатор, который работает на основе использования насекомых, которые очень чувствительны к различным полям и изменениям полей.